Good morning and welcome back from your coffee. Um, my name is Sally Dorjani and I am from Edinburgh Napier University and I'm a member of the PCNG committee. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Murray-Webster, in the right order, um, to talk to us about changing operational norms. Um, so I'll just hand you straight over to Ruth. Mm -hmm. And we'll do about 10, 15 minutes of questions um, at the end of her presentation. Thank you. The only thing that I'm lacking at the moment is the little ticker thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's always quite embarrassing when your picture doesn't look anything like you, doesn't it? <laughs> so this is me, but I've got my specs on. My hair's a bit longer, and I think there's probably a few more pounds on me. But anyway, it's like mental note to change, um, change photographs. Um, so thank you um, very much for inviting me to speak um, to you this morning. Um, there, um, just want to say a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and also a little bit about, about me. So um, some of you, if you come up close to my badge, my badge says that I'm a director at KPMG. That's not a lie. That is my day job. Um, but really what I'm going to talk about this morning um, is some work that I did for my doctoral studies at Cranfield School of Management, drawing um, on one case study that was a case of change within um, the HE sector. Um, but also, over, um, I was self-employed for 20 years before I joined KPMG last year, so um, Jerry talked about culture shops, so I've just had one as well, you know, I'm living through one. Um, but as um, an old change specialist really for most of my career, I've worked across a number of industry sectors, um, but I've had some, some, happy, some happy times working with um, a couple of um, higher education institutions. So I'm here because I worked um, quite a lot with Nicola Hood Alexander when she was at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and I know also I saw Chris Parry's name on the list. Is Chris here? Okay. <laughs> um, I also did some work at University of Nottingham um, with uh, Caroline Williams who um, on um, research and um, learning related change and uh, you know I think really interesting just to um, you know observe some of the changes that are happening in the sector and how IT and technology enable change is, is sort of playing out but really you know not not just about what the technology can bring, but what that means for you know, um, staff ways of working, whether that's academic ways of working, you know, non-academic staff ways of working, and indeed student ways of researching and learning. So I think a really interesting um, sector um, that you're working in, and what I'm going to try and do is take, tell you a bit of a story about why I would want to um, research um, investments in climate change um, and, and what I did and, and apologies that you know, I am a practitioner but I'm going to get a bit theoretical in the middle but not too much um, but the idea is that before um, midday in 25 minutes I will have emerged out into the practitioner world and really you know, sort of look at some of those so what's of my research for the work that, um, that we all do. Um, I have to say that nothing that I say um, represents the opinions or the work of my employer, KPMG LLP. That's a disclaimer out of the way. Not sure whether they agree or not. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, if you're going to do a doctorate, you know, why did I think that um, actually research into plant change um, needed to be done? And I'm, I'm using plant change here to... Um, you know, mean change initiatives that are done intentionally in organisations. They're usually done using some sort of project or, um, or programme management. And, and there obviously is a huge literature, both from an academic point of view and, and also the whole practitioner literature that you know of, whether that's the, you know, the Prince, the MSPs, you know, whether it's APM stuff, whether it's PMI stuff, you know, whether it's... Um, um, more um, IT specific stuff, there's just the ways out there. And also some pretty famous academics who've had fairly sensible things to say. So, you know, we all know Kurt Levine's work and we talk about, you know, unfreeze, change, refreeze, like that's just normal. It's a normal part of, you know, the way we think about, about projects. 
you know, John Cotter's written a lot of books and, you know, his, his advice to, um, you know, to practitioners is, is you know, pretty, um, pretty sound. You know, you need to have a vision, you need to create a sense of urgency, you know, all of that stuff um, is, um, is, is good stuff. But, you know, despite all of that, um, organisations of all, of all sizes struggle to realise the benefits that they intend to get from their investments of change. And I was interested into why that was, and I've consulted in this space for probably about 16 years when I started. And, um, you know, one of the, the sort of jobs that I've had, um, the assignments that I've had just before I started to do my research was actually working for Cranfield in um, a group that was called the um, International um, Centre for Program Management and this is a Cranfield Hewlett Packard um, uh, word? Can't think of the word. partnership, it's a good enough word, um, alliance and um, where um, HP were you know, interested in what best practice might look like for them and wanted to get some, some research to that and I was sort of working as the go-between between the practitioners and the academics because neither because they, they were speaking different languages. Um, so actually when you were talking about the PMO work that came out of that same so then then that was some of the work that I've been doing. Um, and one of the, the the quotes that really struck me was from the then CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services um, for EMEA at the time and he said, you know, um, Although, you know, it is our business to do project-based change for our clients, we find we are unable to change ourselves. And I, I thought that was really interesting. You know, here's an organisation that exists to do projects, big projects for clients, but yet when it comes to changing themselves, they were finding it too hard. Why might that be? So I sort of set off on this, this journey. I'll just build this slide up, actually. It's easier. So... This, this sort of little diagram is intended to be, um, you know, at its simplest level, you know, project business as usual, we might call it in its simplest sense. So the stuff that we do um, to bring about change in temporary organisations, and the academic literature doesn't really talk about project management, but it talks about temporary organisations to bring about, about change. Um, so we've got some stuff, it might be a project, it might be a program, but it's something that the organisation intends to do to bring about change. And then we've got some people doing work that are going to be the recipients of that change. We might call it business as usual, we might sort of externalise it, we might, you know, in a silly way, in my view, uh, as does Prince, call them users, or something that's very... <laughs> You know, out there, oh, I'm really not anything to do with what we're trying to do here. But indeed, you know, they're the people who need to adopt whatever it is you've delivered and use that to, um, to bring about the, the strategic benefits needed by the organisation. So, you know, what I observed um, once I started looking into the literature is that most of the literature, not only practitioner, but from an academic point of view, when you look at plan change, so it's a very change agent centric view. Oh, well, this is what you need to do to manage your project well or bring about your change in order to influence these other people. So I thought, well, there's a bit of, of a spin that I can bring to this. So what I'll try and do is research plan change from the, pe from the perspective of the people who it's happening to, not just the people who are doing it. So that's sort of what I set out to do. Um, now, if you're not in spirit, you know, like, just sort of have a little snooze <laughs> the next few minutes. Um, I adopted um, sort of three theoretical lenses. I won't talk about this for very long, I promise you, but it, it's sort of important to my story. So, there is um, a, a body of literature um, that is called the Organisational Routines Literature. And what this literature does is, is look at um, routines, and routines being um, uh, 
the way that you know multiple multiple stakeholders will will adopt to do work. So it's it's, it's more than a process and it's more than a practice and it encompasses things like beliefs and understanding and sort of human level um, uh, you know motivations and human human level aspects as well as more systemic level aspects and. Um, what these two academics, Brian Patrick and Martha Feldman, who were my heroes for a short period of my life, um, said is that if you really want to understand organisational routines, you've got to get beyond what you observe at the surface and try and understand the internal dynamics of the routines, like what's really happening inside. So I used organisational routine sort of as a proxy for business as usual, like for the work that the project was trying to change, whatever, whatever that was. Um, sort of what linked in with this really well was another, another field of academic study um, that looked at boundary spanning during plan change or temporary organising. So if we just go back, it's got too many bills on this slide, to this one, there is a whole body of literature that looks at they you know, recognise the, the, sort of, um, the overlap between the temporary organisation and the permanent organisation and looks at practices for spanning that boundary. So I also um, uh, drew on, on that literature, and then this is where it sort of got a bit deep in the weeds. Um, and um, so if some of the, the sociologists in the room will, will love this, everybody else will think I'm mad. It's that there is, um, uh, you might. Um, you might have heard of Anthony Giddens, who was at Cambridge, um, and his structuration theory. And, and apparently, Anthony Giddens was a, a key advisor to the Blair uh, Chiefs and the sort of New Labour thing, uh, Tony Blair's government. Um, but you know, what, what Giddens was really um, famous for academically was saying that um, what he put the the reciprocity between what he calls structure and agency. So the, the thing to say that whatever we do, whatever um, any human being actually does, is both at the same time constrained and enabled by our internal thoughts, understandings, feelings, motivations about that thing. So um, there's this simultaneous um, enabling and constraining between structure and agency, he called it, or between you know, what people do or don't do when you're trying to br deliver your project or bring about change, um, based on their understanding of what on earth your plan means, what the organisation structure means, how they feel about the security of their job, what it means about their relationships with their colleagues, and all of that human stuff some of it influenced by um, what this literature would call artifacts. So, you know, when you've got a project and you've got your plan and you've got your board set up and your agendas and your reports and you've got your PMO and your, your list blogs and your issue logs and all your stuff that are the, the external artifacts, if you like, of your project, then you, you really hope that they might influence people a bit you know, not just ping off as being completely pointless um, or indeed cause tensions for people. So, you know, what Giddens would say is, well, you've really got to understand how people think, feel and understand that stuff if you want them to do anything different as, as a result of it. And when people do things or don't do things, because failure to act is as much as an action, as, you know, so, you know, you ask someone to do something and they don't bother, then that, in turn, is, is you know, has got an influence back on then that their internalisation, their understanding of the work. So it can get ever so complicated, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. But um, what I've, I've built through my research, I mean, this took a few years, amazingly, um, to get to this point, was a theoretical model that would then allow me to look at change that was ongoing, look at change that was ongoing from the perspective of the change recipients, so the people whose, whose work, and we use an organisation routine as the as sort of construct to look at their work, but the people whose work was intended to change, 
um, and looking at what change agents were doing, what the projects were doing, what was being fed in as what we call their external structures, how that was affecting what the literature calls external structures, so what people think or, or feel or intend to do as a result of that external stuff, what they actually do up to the agency and when then what the outcomes of that would be intended or not and how that all feeds itself over time. So what my research was, was trying to do was to see this in action and as it unfolded at a fairly granular level uh, over time. And what I did was um, I, I looked at two cases. I'm going to talk about one of them, the one that was set in the university um, context. But I actually did two cases, one in the university context and then the second one was with Transport for London. Um, but the key things about selecting the cases are, are there. Simply that the, the, the work that was intended to change, like, mattered. So I, I chose things where, you know, it wasn't just changing sort of minor procedural things. It was, it was a, a routine that was done that had strategic significance for the organisation. Um, so the routine mattered. I also chose things where there was a proper change initiative set up. So some of them were articulated as projects, some of them as, as programmes, but, but the change in the routine mattered to the organisation. And also, it was really important that I selected cases where the, the organisation that was going through the change seemed to be doing it in a pretty competent way. So where the, you know, it was like the, the change was being managed in what appeared to be a bit of a textbook fashion, although you can never know until you, del until you delved into it. Because what I didn't want to do is look at changes that were just a mess. So these were people who thought they were doing everything right, everything in a fairly competent way, trying to change something that mattered, and how was, how was that playing out? Um, I needed to look back, but I wanted to look at some current, current data um, also. So um, really quickly, um, I've actually named the organisation here because we're in an HE sector and we're, we're um, among friends. Does anybody, did anybody ever come across Intu before it died of death in about 2010? Intu was, um, you know, it was, it was sort of the pre-Google Scholar, Google Scholar, really. <laughs> oh, Google Scholar was a different beast. But, you know, Intu had a vision because Google Scholar didn't exist at the time. It was, um, it was, there was a consortium of seven universities. It was led through Minus at the University of Manchester, but it was Birmingham, Oxford, Harry Watt, uh, Manchester Met. I can't remember the others, and that's bad of me. But there were seven, and it was just, just funded, um, just funded program. Um, and, and what Institute did was um, curated, if you like, um, free at the point of use, um, internet resources for use in scholarly research or study. So the idea is that these were um, resources on the internet, yeah, free at point of use, but they'd been selected as being kosher, really, for use in um, uh, by academics. And um, it, it was a bit of a messy service, and uh, there was quite a lot of money being invested in it by GISC, and there was a huge amount of change that needed to happen to the way that these resources were curated and presented if this was going to have any um, level of efficiency or credibility or sustainability um, over time. And what I did was study this, and I, I looked back, you can see I was doing my work between 2006 and 2010, so it's a little while ago now. Um, but um, I used um, methods of um, looking in, in um, very defined um, time brackets, but also then using this methodological bracketing that I showed on the, um, um, the theoretical model to look at how um, external things like, like plans and old structures and things that were definite were affecting the, the understanding of the people who were doing their work, understanding of the work, feelings about the work, and therefore what they did 
um, in response to this change. Um, if, if, you, if any of you did know anything about this, then you know by the time I finished researching this, the institute had died a death and just had cut the funding. And you could argue that it was at a time when just was cutting a lot of funding. But actually, fundamentally, although this was led by a really competent um, change leader, Caroline Williams, who's now at Nottingham and doing fab work there, um, there were some there were some really interesting things to learn about how you brought about change to the way these university staff across seven universities did their work. These were librarians. How librarians did their work? Um, they were they were lovely, willing, nice people who just couldn't bring themselves to change. You know, there was no badness. There was no resistance in a, like, ooh, baddies resisting change. They understood what needed to be done, they understood why it's important, they really cared and they couldn't bring themselves. And it seems to me that we encounter this in lots of our, in lots of our work. You know, it's not baddies who don't want to do it, it's actually good people who just can't find almost that logic um, for, for bringing about the change. So, what did I learn? I'll sort of dwell on, on this for a while, and this is, some, of it, some of this is quite provocative, maybe. Um, so the first point is, um, I think you would all recognise that sometimes we, we adopt our craft of bringing about, you know, delivering projects and bringing about change in organisations, like it's a bit of a science rather than it is a craft or a bit more of a messy art. And what we do is we write, we write books and do practice guides and we design examinations and we test people and we give people tips and, and all that stuff. And it's really quite prescriptive and it's very much from a change agent change agent um, point of view. I mean, even the words resistance to change, which are really, you know, popular and I would chop them off, you know, with the next person, very much externalises the people who are going through through change. So we're talking about users or you know stakeholders in a sort of an externalised um, way does that. Um, so you know we, we we need some guidelines. I'm you know I've been I, I met Nicola um, when she was doing a MSP exams. You know I've been there. I've got the badges. Um, I think the badges are important, but they're absolutely, um, you know, necessary but not sufficient for the sort of change that you're bringing about in your organisation. And particularly in HE, where there's all those cultural and contextual things that Jerry talked about earlier that, you're, that, you, need to, um, that you need to deal with. Really, really interesting sector. Um, second point, this is, this is a real um, uh, surprising finding for me. And that was, um, so back to Kurt Levine's, you know, what we need to do is we need to unfreeze so we can move people and then we can freeze them up again. Assumes that the routine, like the work that people are doing in the first place, is frozen. I.e., there's one version of the truth about what this work is, and there aren't multiple understandings and conceptions and variations on the work in the first place. Because if it's all messy in the first place and you're trying to move it, that's a lot harder than moving something that everybody agrees is the way that it's done. And what I found in both of my case studies was that actually the Transport for London people have not recognised it in these terms but they've done it, is that so if, you, if you're going to really change something, getting a common understanding of the thing that you're changing before you try to do it is really, really important. So maybe you need to, you need to freeze before you can unfreeze and move. Um, and, you know, some interesting um, sort of ideas about how, how you, you might do that. Um, I think you, you, know, you would all agree that successful change, it comes from people working together, it comes from, it comes from dialogue, and this is, and so, 
actually the people who we employ as, and I'm using change agents in a, in a wide sense, they might be project managers, they might be program managers, they might be business change managers, they, you know, they, might, they might be business analysts, they might, there's all sorts of roles, they might be sponsors, but people who are um, um, you know, charged with bringing about the, the beneficial change, um, I think don't automatically have the skills to do what's necessary. And I think that it's actually a really complex set of capabilities that people like you guys and, and your teams need to have. Because, you know, what we've tended to um, recognise as being really essential for project managers is um, an ability to be organised and an ability to organise other people. And that's really, really important. You know, we need people, we need business analysts who are analytical, who can really diagnose, who can, who can really help the organisation, you know, like understand its as is and, and like paint that picture of its to be in a very systematic and organised way and, and organise work and corral, you know, large groups of people to do fairly complex things. All that's really important. But actually, there are some behavioural things that are also um, not simple to do. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the things that you know, I, I really realised through my research and watching really closely how, how change agents work with change um, recipients is just being able to be, at the same time, empathetic and understanding and understanding enough about the change recipient's point of view to know how to craft the change but being distant enough to make the really hard decisions and drive them, drive them through it. I was really interested when Joe said benevolent dictatorship. I don't know whether that's what I mean but I think it is, it's something about being you know, understanding enough about what it's going to take for people to change their behaviour, the way they use your technology that you've delivered or whatever, um, you know, and, and understanding enough so you can be really persuasive, but at the same time holding a distant enough position to be really intentional. And what I found was, depending on the sort of change, um, then you actually need different sorts of people and there's some really interesting research that's been done by a couple of academics, uh, uh, Batilana and Castiana, I think the name is, Batilana's at Harvard, but they did, um, they did research in the NHS um, and uh, over a, few, sorry, a huge, uh, huge range of projects and programmes and looked at um, how the, the closeness of the, the project manager or the change leader to the work that was being changed um, played out. And, you know, there's almost um, a sense that we say, oh, well, if you're an expert in the area to be changed, if you really understand it, you'll be better at it. And what the research would show is that if the change is not too radical, if it's sort of more incremental, then that's true. But actually, if you're trying to do something really fundamental, something that's going to transform academic ways of working, something that's going to you know, transform the ways that, that students use libraries or transform the ways that um, you know, academics teach, then, then actually your change agents need to be much less close. You can be too close for comfort and, and need to have much more distance to make some of those hard decisions. So, um, just to um, sort of wrap up, um, there was some people in Cranfield that um, had this initiative that said, what we want to do is we want to have, like, pictures of people's doctorates on a page. I thought that was a bold idea. <laughs> um, like, I've been at this for five years, and you want it on a page. This is their version <laughs> of my doctorate. <laughs> Um, on a page, I mean, it's not all there, but I think you know the strap line was all in this together. How do we do plan change beyond prescriptions, and maybe moving from? I think these are supposed to be alligators in the sea here, and people crossing from the chasm. But where the old thinking was, um, 
we've got change agents, project managers, program managers, whatever, tasked with making sure benefits are delivered. Um, a sort of a paradigm of follow the rule book and all will be well, comply with print to follow the, you know, do this, do that. Um, and in old thinking, um, almost a mindset that the people who need to change will resist change, that, that change recipients will resist change, and then they need to be influenced to let go of the old and move to the new. And I think that, you know, what um, I guess I was um, always quite just unhappy as a person about that, and what I tried to do was really get some more insights about how that interplay between how people, what people, you know, believe about their work, think about their work, feel about their work, and intend to do that work, um, actually enables and constrains their action or inaction, and how our projects need to break into that in their design um, and in their implementation and in their handover if we're actually going to bring about um, benefits of strategic value to our organisations um, going forward. So, um, that's about on time, I think. That's sort of what I've planned to say. Now, if anybody is sad enough to want to read my thesis, you are very welcome. <laughs> and there's a couple of conference papers um, that I'm really happy to share. Um, I, I, I have abandoned academia to go to the um, dark and dirty world of consultancy um, again, so I've got no time to write, but um, I'm really happy to share my work, and um, you know, if anybody you know, wants to follow up, not with Cape Energy trying to sell you anything, um, but you know, just in the interests of people like you who are struggling you know, with, the, with the art of projects and programs and bringing out really, really important change for our organisations, things that affect people's lives as well as, um, you know, sort of have um, you know, uh, other, other benefits, um, then uh, really happy to share and obviously really happy to take your questions. Any questions for Ruth at all? literature, um, I mean, it, it sort of recognises that, and, and, you know, it's so all the stuff around, you know, painting a really compelling vision and, you know, having the to be, if you like, you know, defined and articulated, you know, really clearly. I think they're all things that can help, but I think they're not enough. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I think some of it, I mean, it depends what the change is. I mean, some of these people, um, at the t it was really interesting because at the time, it wasn't a change where any of the staff involved, about 50 staff who were involved in this routine across these universities, it wasn't that any of their jobs were at risk at the time that the change started in 2006. Quite the opposite. This could have grown like mad. They all lost their jobs at the end. Um, but you know, so it, it wasn't. It, but what they were being asked to do is fundamentally change the way they they even conceived of their work. And I think that what happened was, um, and, and I know Caroline Williams, you know, who's not here, will be really happy for me to say this. I know she's grown enormously as a change leader through this. Is that what Caroline and her team of line managers did was they really empathised with those staff. They understood how it was. They, they too had been librarians. They got it, <laughs> how this was going to be really hard, but they empathised so much that they couldn't bring, they couldn't almost like get them to do it. I think um, and one of the problems was that the change needed to be co-created by the people doing the work. It's not like the project team had the answer. And so we're just, 
you know, because there's some changes we're doing, you know, we just say, look, we're going to stop using this, we're just going to stop using this method and we're going to start using this method. And we just start on, there's no negotiation. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying it's easy to implement that, but in this particular change, the, the people doing the job were co-creators of the future situation and uh, there, wasn't, there just wasn't enough pull from the change leaders and I think some of the, you know, some of it is vision, some of it is coaching, some of it is having really um, uh, useful measurement systems that, that so, you know, they, they, I think they just didn't do enough market research, they weren't listening to users, they had their head down, they weren't seeing what was happening with Google Scholar. You know, it was, it was out of context. So I, I don't think there's one answer, but yeah, lots of things to think about depending on what the change you're doing is. Okay. I'm afraid you'll have to stop Ruth there, but she'll be around for the rest of the day. I think Ruth, I'm going to be around a little bit, yeah, and I need to uh, leave her. If you have any questions for her then. Yeah. Well, thank you. It just leaves me to thank you very much for quite a thought provoking presentation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Okay. <laughs>